Working Cows Podcast, Episode 86. Welcome to the podcast that gives producers a platform to discuss and share paradigm-challenging practices. Practices that have increased the effectiveness of their operation and the joy that their families have received from this lifestyle. Hi everybody, this is Clay Connery, host of the Working Cows podcast, powered by the Global Ag Network, and this episode is brought to you by the High Plains Ranch Practicum, more for them, from them in a bit, but just to let you know, High Plains Ranch Practicum registration is open, you can check it out at ran- hpranchpracticum.com. Today we're going to talk with Glenn Jensen, he is a vet in Utah. He reached out to me and said, you know, I think we've got some good discussions happening here on the Working Cows podcast. I'd like to add to that discussion with a discussion about breeding soundness exams in bulls. And so we're going to talk to Glenn about kind of his challenge to the paradigm of breeding soundness exams and some things that we could do to maybe get a little bit more accurate picture of how those bulls are actually going to perform on a year-to-year basis. So Glenn, thanks for joining me today on the Working Cows podcast. Well, thank you for having me. I'm excited to share some, I hope, some good information that will be uh, important for uh, cattle producers everywhere. You reached out to me and wanted to talk about bull breeding soundness exams and the yearly bull. So can you kind of give us a a start of where you would start if you were looking to implement this practice uh, in an operation that hadn't been making use of it to that point in its history? Yeah, I, I sure can. Um, you know, first of all, I guess, um, I like to kind of create maybe a little background and and understanding, and I don't know what, um, different people understand on bull breeding sinus exams. And and I guess the uniqueness of it in different areas, and especially in the yearling bull, there's a a real unique part of it. And, and the uniqueness there is, is that, uh, there's a, a period of basically a time of puberty, but then sexual development and how long and what it takes basically for these to become, or the bulls to become, uh, I guess, developed enough or sexually mature enough to actually, uh, produce. And then also to be able to, um, get to where they need to be to pass an examination. Um, and it becomes quite unique. Uh, I think too, one of the important things is to, to try to create a, an understanding of basically um, the importance of um, bull fertility. And I might even turn that around for just a second and maybe, uh, Clay, understand that you have been around cow-calf operation quite a bit, and I might even ask a question to maybe create this picture, and that is, is um, when you go to a bull cell, what do you look for? Birth weight, weaning weight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like that because I, I think that's very true and pretty pretty um normal and that's what i see too uh is is that and and i think in my mind and you can tell me if if you think the same thing or a little different and maybe the audience can think you know what do i think of too and why uh but that is is so why do we think of those things And, and in my mind i think it's because that's what's put out in front of us all the time so when it comes to bull fertility then the question is is what is put out in front of us and I don't know if you have an input on that. I could tell you what I'm, what I see, and then maybe you could tell me what you see too. And that is, is I see basically that the cattle producers pretty much have a bull breeding sinus exam most of the time, maybe not all of them. Uh, so I'm talking about the bull producers specifically, and they basically say, well, they've been semen checked or fertility checked, or they'll say, well, they're guaranteed fertile. So is that kind of what you see? Yeah, yeah basically and, semen and, tested. That's you know that's the the lingo that you get on the thirty second radio ad or in the, you know, the flyer that you get about the sale is that they're semen tested. Correct. Good. And so then the question is, is what does that mean? Or, or I might even ask the question, what does a fertility guarantee mean? And so, you know, what exactly is that? And so maybe to look at a little bit is because I've listened to several of your podcasts and I, and I love the fact that, you know, we're looking at paradigms and we're looking at trying to understand how we look or think about things. And so if I was to look at a piece of ground and I would say, is that a fertile ground? What does that mean? Hmm. 
and and the the gamut i guess can be quite a bit different and so as i talk to several producers um i also hear something quite commonly uh and that is well i know the bowl is good because i have calves out of it and sometimes i think the paradigm today is that it seems to be for many producers not everybody but seems to be black and white a bowl either is fertile or they are not fertile when yet that is not truly the way that it goes. The reality is that most bulls are, uh, it's not one where there's, there's quite a bit of difference in, in different levels of subfertility. And so what is subfertility? Well, it's basically, uh, if I'm using a bull, it'd be basically, you know, can he achieve 100% pregnancy? Does he have that capability to do so? That'd be a 100% fertile bull. And it's probably never going to happen. You know, I'll never say never, I guess, but it's not too likely. Um, so what would a subfertile bull be? And, and again, that might depend on a person's um, perspective. But a subfertile bull generally would be defined as a bull that's probably not achieving what or cannot achieve what our goals would be. And so uh, with that thought, then, what are our goals? And what would be considered to be a real fertile uh, herd? And if we look at efficiencies, and in the reproductive area, uh, then the question is, is what, what should we be trying to achieve? Uh, so maybe I could, to create maybe more of an uh, understanding, again, ask you a question. And, and I think everybody might be at a different point of this. But in a cow-calf operation, what records do we keep and what are our goals for, um, for reproductive efficiency? So I don't know if you have any thoughts on that one. You know, from the bull side, I guess we don't probably pay too much attention to it because the turnover rate on bulls is so high, for one. And two, uh, when we have paid attention to it, it's been a result of an issue with a bull. So we had a bunch of calves that looked similar that were struggling to be um, vigorous at birth, and most of them died and kind of had the same look to them as far as frame and some coloration and stuff like that. So we had those genetically tested and then we traced it back to a couple of bulls in our herd and we shipped those bulls down the road basically is is kind of how we have handled it um so that's that's basically it you know if we if we have found an issue in the in the calves that are being produced we will go back and test that those bulls and see which ones were were throwing us some calves that were uh giving us problems so I, I like that because I like that in the fact that I think that's fairly common paradigm as far as, uh, you know, we basically, and in this case, of course, you're talking about a, an area where there are some genetic problems, um, going back and identifying that. And I think that oftentimes we do act basically after the fact and try to figure out what problem, which is important. Um, but to take a more proactive state, especially when it comes to reproduction uh, and the efficiency one of the goals that we have is, is we want to basically make it so that um, our reproduction is not wasting. Uh, so what I'm, what basically we generally look at for that is most of the time to have a really good uh, reproductively effective herd and to get rid of uh, inefficiencies, we want to be able to have a short calving period, generally three cycles, so approximately 60, 63 days. Um, and stick with that. There may be times and reasons to go longer. Uh, and then within that, what we want to look at is, is how many cattle are we getting pregnant during that first 21 days? So now the way we think about that is, is why is that important? What do we do to make this uh, effective? And why, why is that first 21 days important? And if I got, say, 50% of them pregnant during that first 21 days and the other 50% during the next 40 some days, uh, you know, what does that mean to my bottom line? And if you think about it, everything that's born after that 21 days, you lost 21 days of production. Uh, take that and an easy number to take it as times by two, meaning that that's 40, about 41, 42 pounds uh, of production. Now take that and times by however much you're getting per pound and start to add it up. And you can start to see basically the costs and what is involved. So I did something um, just to kind of look at this. And I actually created a spreadsheet in Excel. And I says, all right, so let's assume that one bull is 80% effective. So that means that he will get uh, or has a chance to get 81% of the cattle pregnant or 80% of them. Uh, and another bull, compare that to 60%. 
And then if you're looking at records, then the question is, is what, uh, what are we going to see uh, difference? And so uh, when you look at that, what's really fascinating is, uh, and assuming that you're going to keep a bull for five years, and you may or may not do that, but the part that I find really interesting is, is that on an 80% effective, your pregnancy rate at the end, uh, assuming nothing else happened, and I realize that this never really happens, so this is more of an illustration, but in three cycles, you have 99.2% uh, basically pregnancy rate. On a 60%, so a 20% difference, you got 936 and just for information that's going between, say, 7%, you got 97.3. So there's just a small percent. But when you look at each cycle and you look at basically the difference between it and the losses, uh, you uh, end up with about $2,000 loss between an 80% and a 60%. And that doesn't only come from lost calves, but it comes from lost weight gained by those. So hopefully that makes sense. Yeah. Yep. So that's the first thing I think we have to understand is, is what are we after and why? Now we can start talking about the bull breeding sinus exam itself. Uh, so just like trying to get the most you can out of an acre of pasture and how do you do that, how do we also get the most we can out of a bull? Uh, yes. And what does that mean? What do we look for? So then the next thing I'd like to do then is think about what's called a veterinary bull breeding sinus evaluation or exam. Uh, and basically, to, to make it fairly short, but put it down, there's three areas that we look at. One would be the physical exam. Uh, and if there's anything there that makes it so the bull can't perform and do it, then basically that would be kind of cold or, or, or corrected, one or the other. Um, uh, that includes scroll circumference. And scroll circumference is important because the larger the scroll circumference, the more cattle that bull has potential to cover. So he can produce more semen, basically. So that's part of the physical exam. And we look at several other things. Then we basically collect a, a semen sample. And in that semen sample, we look for two things. One would be motility. The other one is morphology. So let me describe what that is. Motility is progressive motility. It's basically how many of those uh, cells, those sperm cells, are in a progressive movement. Morphology is basically the cell structure itself. Now, looking at the importance of all those, we can't really say that none of them are unimportant, but morphology is the most important one as far as when it comes to terms of what do we see that creates the most problems within our bulls. Uh, there was a study done in Michigan, a retrospective study over the years that they were basically uh, testing bulls. And in their study, they basically looked at it and they said that uh, motility really had in their group of cattle over several years, or groups of cattle, I guess, they basically found that uh, motility had very little impact on the final decision. So morphology was the big thing. So morphology then, the cell structure, and why that's important is, is that in any one uh, sperm cell, if there's a morphological problem with that, one of the things that can happen is, is it may not create pregnancy, but also it may create a pregnancy, but because the DNA or other things are abnormal, basically you end up with an abortion. And you usually don't see that. It usually doesn't go clear out to the point where you'd ever see anything. It may be uh, that they become pregnant. They're only pregnant for a few days, a few weeks, maybe a month, something like that. And basically, they lose that calf and then recycle. So sometimes what you may see, if a bull was really bad and you happen to notice it, you may just see um, late calves just come a little bit later. Give them enough chances, you know. So in other words, if I, if I even had a, a bull that was 50% effective and give them enough chances, eventually I can get them all pregnant. And just keep working on it. Right. Um, but how much money did you lose in between time? Sure. So now... I take that and I turn that back around. And I say, okay, so we're going to look for morphology. Um, and what can we do with that uh, when it comes to genetic selection? And, and the paradigm I would like to look at is, is uh, for cow-calf producers to start asking that question. Um, you know, what, what did we basically find throughout uh, the tests and stuff that were done from the bull producer? And here's where, again, thinking about a paradigm that I, I have become, and this is kind of why I, and I'm glad you invited me and was willing to, to talk to me uh, on what became my little paradigm that I had found. And that is, is that uh, I, I spent quite a bit of time trying to do a really good job with bull breeding and sinus exams. 
So I purchased better equipment, what's called a phase contrast microscope, has better optics, has those types of things with the hope, I want to do a better job at this. And something happened to me that I wasn't anticipating that I had no clue about. And that is, is that I started finding more problems, more morphologically abnormal cells. So I started not passing or creating this classification of a satisfaction potential breeder. Uh, and so what happened was, is bull producers quit using me as much. <laughs> yeah. And so I'd like to ask another question. So if you're a bull producer, how many bulls would you like to sell? Hmm. As many as I can. Exactly. And we all, <laughs> that's a normal human thing. That is not, and you, you can't blame them for that. You can't blame anybody for that. That's, that's the goal. We want to sell as many as we can. And so without understanding the significance of it, uh, so what you do then, if you're a bull producer, is, is you basically find somebody who can uh, pass as many of these bulls as you possibly can. And then the question is, though, is what is the potential that that might be creating to the buyer? And you may say even the unsuspected buyer. And I don't want to make this a, a picture like, oh, well, um, bull producers are just in it for the money or anything like that. I don't really think that's how they think of it. I really believe that for the most part, um, you know, they just have certain goals and that the thought process may not be going much further than the fact that you know, one veterinarian or one individual passes more than the other one, uh, not really thinking about the potential to a buyer or what may be going on there. And so, so if you basically then have a, a bull sale and to illustrate it, I asked a producer who produces somewhere between 30 and 35 bulls a year. I asked him the question, uh, I said, so how many bulls? And he was actually having several of his bulls checked at a bull station and some other areas uh, so he hadn't been my client for a while, uh, basically checking bulls. And I asked him, I said, so how many bulls are not, or you're not able to sell because of the bull breeding and soundness exam? And he says, well, this year, two of them didn't. But the last two years before this, he had 100% of them. So if I think about that, just make a quick number. It sounds like it was somewhere near 100 bulls with two of them that didn't pass. So is that what we'd normally expect or not? Good question. So there's actually some studies that were done by a, uh, a researcher and a veterinarian in, in Western Canada. Last name is Barth. Um, he's done a tremendous amount of research uh, and one of the gurus of bull breeding and soundness exams. If you have questions, he's probably the guy that can answer it. Um, and these studies were done about 20 years ago, so they're maybe a little old and hopefully things have progressed since then. But the studies basically showed that sometimes uh, especially in bulls that are somewhere around 12 months of age, that as low as 50% of them are actually sexually mature enough to pass hmm. a bull brain sinus exam when proper procedures are followed and when it's scrutinized to the point where it's supposed to be. So I would definitely say that there's a possibility that may be different today. Just like if you look at the way that pounds have been increased, or the way that even squirrel circumference have been increased by basically selecting those bulls that you're after and those traits that you're wanting to. There is selection being done. So hopefully today it's better than that. And I believe that it is, but I don't believe that it's 98%. I, I really would say that's probably not going to be the fact. And so then the question would be is, is what is it that a, uh, a bull buyer might should look for or do? And I think that's difficult. What I would like to see done, because morphology is one of the most important things, because it does take a certain skill set. Um, and in fact, a quick story on that, because of kind of talking to different individuals, um, Penn State has a, an andrology lab. So andrology is the study of male reproduction. So, uh, and, and I had talked to the, the veterinarian um, that basically is, is over that, and the guy who's over the, uh, the PhD, and I uh, apologize, I don't remember his name, but he, he was telling me that if I'm looking to send semen off to have it checked, to even make sure that basically you were having somebody that is used to looking at bull semen, not necessarily horses. So you can get specialists basically, hmm. and that specialist may be used to look at horses or say pigs uh, or cattle. And there's what they refer to as nuances in basically looking at and how you assess basically um, morphology in the semen. Uh, and to be careful, what I would love to see happen, and we're probably a ways off, but if we all become better educated and ask, start asking more questions, start 
push in the direction to improve our herd fertility and the industry in herd fertility. I would like to see us actually create labs that we as veterinarians send the semen off to. So if he's mm-hmm. telling me that even somebody who uh, has a PhD is basically um, an expert in reproduction, expert at looking at semen, and he's saying don't have somebody that uh, just looks at horse semen, make sure it's somebody who's used to looking at bull semen. Um, what about us as veterinarians? I think we all try to do a really good job. And I think we do do a pretty decent job, but we're not an expert like that. And on top of that, we also have a business to run. And so one of the things that spurred this was uh, a couple months ago, I had a producer come to me who raises uh, quite a few bulls. And he says, I can't use you. He's trying to be really nice. I cannot use you because you don't pass enough bulls and I can't afford you. So from his mind is, as he's basically saying, uh, you need to become a little more lenient so I can sell more bulls. And I, and I would say he's most likely not really looking at the potential effect uh, that some of those bulls would potentially have on an unsuspected buyer. The other comment was that, well, nobody ever says anything or brings their bull back, back to our first part of the conversation. Uh, what does fertility mean? Mm-hmm. And how many individuals are going to take a bull back because they're 10 to 20% less? Well, I didn't get my 95% pregnancy rate out of them. It was, it was 88%. How many people are going to take a bull back for that? Well, he's fertile, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what, what did that mean? So he's not having people. So within your mind, you're thinking everything is great. Everything is fine uh, without any concerns or complaints. Um, but then if a 20% difference over a five-year period on one bull breeding 30 cattle can make a difference of $13,000, that's pretty significant. And I think mm-hmm. the industry and every rancher needs to start looking at that. And if we're not currently uh, keeping records and looking at how many am I getting pregnant each cycle, either from your preg check time, uh, which if done before 90 days can actually be pretty accurate, um, or, uh, which is a little less accurate, but still gives you a good idea, um, records basically at calving time and actually looking at how many are pregnant each cycle, how many calves am I getting that first cycle, second cycle, third cycle, uh, and trying to push that to as many calves as I can get during that 21st cycle. I was also talking to a guy just last week. I says, what's one of your goals? And I thought, this is exciting. He's got a great goal. He says the highest he's ever been able to get in that first cycle was 67%, um, but he'd love to get 80. He says, that's my goal. That'd be great. If I get 80% that first time uh, through, that'd be good to do. With that goal, then the question is, is would he be able to do that if that bull is only 60% effective? And the answer, of course, is no way. It's not going to happen. And you've got to look then at basically that potential effectiveness of, of the bull. I'll admit it's difficult. And one of the things that's difficult is how much is due to the bull, how much is due to the cow, how much is due to management. And also the other difficulty is just like an EPD, you can get an EPD that this bull should be uh, raising an increase 10 pounds per animal at weaning weight. They don't all do that. We know that. They're, They're a great indication and they will push us the right direction, but it's not perfect. And, and we understand that. That's the same way with a bull breeding soundness exam. You can have a bull that appears to do really well. Um, and I think that has scared people to create a comparison. And in fact, some veterinarians are afraid to, they say, oh, we shouldn't be really comparing this because we know that every bull is not going to basically perform. Meaning if I had one with morphology of of 85 and another one of 75, am I going to see a difference? And you're not always going to. So it's difficult. However, if you look at a population of bulls and you have a spread in there, then you will see difference. And that has been proven. And so if we try to purchase and look at bulls that are higher uh, in morphology, then, and we're putting genetic selection on it, then the, the assumption should be we're going to improve reproduction. Mm-hmm. There would be some people that say, ah, oh, yeah, but, but what about, and they'd ask the question, what about the fact that, that we know that they won't all basically do that, that I can have a, a, a bull that looks really good and he just doesn't perform, and that will happen. But if we want to push the industry, we've got to change the way we're thinking about it. 
Glenn, just a quick break to talk to the people a little bit about High Plains Ranch Practicum at hpranchpracticum.com. You can get all the information you need to uh, make a decision about being involved in the class. And it's worth the drive. I just want to let you know it's worth the drive. Uh, if you're in a state that touches... Uh, if you're in a state that touches Wyoming, I think that it's worth the drive. Montana, South Dakota, uh, Nebraska, Colorado, Idaho, Utah, one of those states. If you're near Colorado and you can make the drive and, and make time to get there, uh, let me encourage you to take the opportunity to be a part of the class of the High Plains Ranch Practicum. It's a great set of instructors, a great curriculum, great opportunity to get into a classroom and to talk to some people about different paradigms and challenge your own paradigms with the way other people are doing it. And, you know, the networking opportunity is half or more of the benefit of something like that. So hpranchpracticum.com bringing you this episode of the Working Cows podcast. So Glenn, I think what we've done here so far is laid out a really good foundation and your uh, article in Beef Magazine will be linked at the show notes page, which is workingcows.net slash 86. Will be the link for the show notes page today, workingcows.net slash 87. You have a, a uh, article there in Beef Magazine called Who Pays the Piper? Uh, the Cost of Subfertile Bulls. And so we'll link that in the show notes page today. And so just something that I want to make sure I'm clear on, a subver- subfertile bull is a, or I guess if we were going to have a, a maximally a f- maximally fertile bull, that would be a bull that is capable of getting pregnant 100% of the cows that he breeds the first time he covers them. That's that's kind of the maximally effective dream bull that doesn't exist, right? That is correct. That's yeah, exactly. And it, and it doesn't, but man, that'd be that'd be the goal to push for. <laughs> right. And of course, and so anything below that is subfertile. Yeah. Is what uh, you're of some kind or another. And it may not be that it's really going to affect what we normally see too much, or it may, and it may affect it quite a bit. And so rather than asking, is he fertile or is he not? Maybe I should ask how fertile or what can I expect or get out of this bull? It's a hard question to ask without an easy answer. But if we're not looking at those parameters, you know, we, then we basically, we don't know. More importantly, if we're purchasing a bull that hasn't been checked, uh, then what is the chances that we're picking up a bull that basically may have that subfertility? And we, we don't realize it. Uh, most people don't run just one bull. We're going to run one bull with four or five others. So that, that effect gets diluted and that dilution effect makes it so we would very seldom ever have it. So we've got to be checking the bulls. We've got to be looking at them. Um, and there's a lot of different reasons that we would want to look at these bulls. For instance, we've been talking about the yearling bull and checking them. I would say too that there is within what we do, there's a problem with basically who then is paying for the bull breeding Santa's exam. There's an automatic bias there. It's a human nature. It's not their fault. Anybody and everybody I think would do that. I don't, I don't, I don't believe that that's really their thing as far as a, a problem. But the problem becomes the fact that when within the industry that us as cow calf producers buying the bulls has pretty much handed over to them the reins of making sure that bull is where it should be. We haven't taken the reins ourselves and says, where is this bull at? And have I made sure that I'm getting what I'm expecting to get? And what am I expecting to get? And I'm not looking at it. I'm not looking at it when I go to buy it. I'm not asking those questions because, you know, one of my favorite sayings is, I don't know what I don't know. (laughs) <laughs> and most of us don't know that we're supposed to be looking at it, you know, and that's, that's another reason to hopefully gain this better understanding and look at it. So uh, I'd like to see today, you know, there's two things that could happen. One is the industry could change so that veterans like myself send it off to basically somebody else to look at a third party. So we're not put the pressure on us. Somebody who's out of the picture who basically doesn't feel that pressure as a veterinarian. And most veterinarians have probably maybe not all of us felt that pressure. Um, and even if the, even if the bull producer doesn't say anything, you still feel it. It's like, ah, uh, I just felt a lot of his bulls. That's costing him a lot of money. And he may not say a thing, but we still, we still feel bad. And so if that could be removed, that's one, but today that's not happening. So what else can we do? Make sure that there's a, an agreement 
as you purchase that bull. What happens if he's not and what does that mean? And then you have to take the reins on yourself and have him checked within the next, I would say, 60 days and make sure that he's fitting where he needs to be. But then the next question is, is where you're having that and how it's being checked, is that being done right? Um, and we could start sending it. Penn State, basically, we can send the samples off to them. It's around $18 a sample. That's a pretty inexpensive investment. I really would like to see us start to utilize these labs. As we start to use them, more and more labs will become available. The universities right now just say, I don't have a need for it because they're not being supported. We start to send it to them. In the industry, we start to change it, and they will respond in like. They will create more labs. They'll create more more ways for us to get the things done that we need to. Or an industry standard lab could spring up you know, on its own and, and kind of carve out its own niche in the market and say, this is what we're here to provide is this service that's going to actually tell you what the morphology of that sperm is. And it's going to give you some range of a scoring system, you know, you know, do, do we turn it into like the body condition scoring system where you've got this, this uh, semen scoring system that tells you these are good sperm, you know, and they're, they're morphologically viable sperm, I guess, and, and kind of go from there. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And there's been some parts of the industry that have been scared of that and some reasons behind it. I think we need to change our mind on that one. And that is, is if we want to put genetic pressure and if I, knowing what I know right now, if I am actually a bull producer and I'm looking for those genetics, I'm going to make sure that I'm looking at that one because I want to make sure that one, my bulls can mature before 14 months of age and become sexually mature enough to, to pass that exam. Uh, and then I'm also going to, instead of a cutoff of 70%, I'm going to look for higher because I want some kind of leeway there. If I'm getting a bull that's around 70, 75, 72%, somewhere in that neighbor, there's a chance that if that's my genetics, I'm going to have a tougher time with some of the bulls I'm producing to be as high as I'd like to. So I want to push that forward. I want to push that up. And yes, uh, if I do that and do that with enough of my genetics, um, I can then push my genetics in a forward direction to increase the reproductive potential of the bulls I produce. You know, I would put a gear of 80 plus percent and that's very achievable. Uh, That way you have that, that cushion, if you will, Um, and so the other thing too, I think it would be important to do, and then let's turn that around and say, okay, so every year I'm checking my bulls, uh, each year and I have a bull that maybe didn't make that 70% cutoff. He's a 65. I have to ask myself a few questions. What created that 65? We know that there's genetic potential there. We also know that there's environmental things that can affect that. Uh, environmental things can be as is what's been the temperature, especially if it gets too hot. It's one of the biggest ones, but any stress can also do it. Uh, stresses have been proven to show that. Uh, I just um, did a, a group of 60 some bulls uh, the end of February. It had been really cold beforehand. So two things happen at that time. I checked them at that time and There's something called spermatogenesis, basically a production and how long it takes. It takes 61 days to produce that. And then it goes into the epididymis for a storage, takes about another 10 days. And so that's 70 days approximately. We also know that there is some seasonality. So basically you have some time in there that uh, things just aren't going to go as well as they should. And that's the middle of the winter time. That's been shown and proven. So if I'm checking the end of February, I'm checking that at a time that's probably at the bull's worst. And so... On a lot of those, and it was also really cold, wet, they're laying down in the snow. And how's that stress? And how's those things affecting spermatogenesis in the norm of normal cells? Uh, I would really be better off to check those bowls closer to the time that we're going to use them. The producer also, though, does need some time to make sure they can replace those bowls. And I have a lot of people that will check them before all the bowl cells, which tend to want to push that envelope as early as possible. I'd love to see people to relax a little bit, wait a month. You're going to get more, more bulls to pass. You're going to get, you know, it's garbage in, garbage out. You mm-hmm. basically do this at a time of year that it's cold. And again, this is just think about this, you know, um, ask the question. Yeah, I'm trying to get my bulls out in front of everybody at an early time. But what's that creating as far as the pressure on the bulls in a way that am I getting the results out that I need? 
whether it be pulmonary arterial pressure testing. I don't know if too many people in some areas of the world, we do that a lot in higher altitudes. Other areas may not mm. know what it is. But if it's really cold outside, I'm not going to get the results that are legitimate because it's being affected by the weather. That's the same way with the bull breeding sounds. If we can back that off, a bull buyer will buy it just as easy the 1st of February as they will the 1st of March. I mean, not February. Back that up. 1st of April is the 1st of March. In other words, allow some time for basically more maturity, get a little bit more in the spring, those types of things. So things like that can be done to help out the bull producer and to give us results that are really telling us something that then we can use as a gauge to improve and know which animals should be cold, which ones shouldn't, and push genetics in a good direction. So this is this is the first year I've started to hear bull sale advertisements, including a two-year breeding guarantee, where they're guaranteeing that those bulls are going to be good for two years. Uh, if you know they get hurt or whatever in the next two years, they'll take them back and and replace the bull for you. And so this is maybe because I think they've run out of other value propositions to give, you know, to, to the bull buyer. The bull breeders and producers have run out of other value propositions to give because we've kind of maxed out production. We've maxed out a lot of these other things in the industry. And so I think what you're talking about is another potent, potential value proposition that they could be offering to the bull buyer in saying that we've had these uh, we've had these bulls semen tested in a way that tells us about their uh, their their sperm composition, and th- we know that they're good, and they are eighty two percent good, rather than the industry average of seventy percent. So I think that's an, maybe another opportunity for the industry to drive fertility forward, uh, as far as saying we are measuring something else that nobody else is measuring. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. Great. And and what I would do just to add a step to that is, is take that bull by the horn, so to speak, and let's go ahead and have our veterinarian send it into a lab and have a third party read it. You want a vet right. proposition? There you go. Uh, that can easily be done. Uh, it isn't difficult. Yes, it's something. It's a paradigm shift. Uh, you know, that thing we want to do, let's change how we do things to something better. Uh, and so let's create that shift in the way we think about it. And that would be great. You know, that that idea of a third party sent into a lab, looked at this, and they verified that everything that we're good and what the percent is. And then allow the producer to look at that and think about just like I want to look at and think about the EPDs I'm looking at. What is my herd need? And what's the most important things for me? If you look at much of the literature, reproductive efficiency is five times more important than weight gain Hmm. or your weaning weights. Hmm. Yeah. So think about that and then think about how and how much emphasis we are putting on uh, reproduction. And of course, that needs to be not just the bull. It has to be other things too. But the bull's got to not be forgotten. And we have to remember it. It isn't fertile or not fertile. It's not black and white. Hmm. It's a gamut of everywhere from, yeah, you'll get a few that are infertile, very, very few. And of course, we're probably not going to see that 100% one either. It's somewhere between. Where's that bowl between? And what parameters do we have today to do that? Yeah, it's not a perfect world, but neither neither are our EPDs and neither are some of the other things that we continue to look at. Um, Most of the time in, in my area, we look at those PAP scores. And we want to see something usually under a 42. But if it's a 44 and I know it was basically there, everything else is good and I'm not running to real high altitude, I'm going to buy that bolt. It's not a big deal. It, it's going to work for what I need. I can, I can live with that. So going back to what I was talking about a little bit before, if I basically then have a bowl check and let's say it's a 60, let's say it's 68, that's only 2% under that 70, that black and white cutoff that we have created. And he's not a dominant bull. He's a four-year-old and it's going to cost me say $3,000 to replace him. Is it worth that $3,000 to replace him? If he's a dominant bull, we, we know that dominant bulls are going to basically produce 50 to 60% of our cows, calves. Again, depending on the operation and, and depending on where we're at, if he's not dominant, I probably am not going to lose $3,000 for him to keep him another year. And I can replace him next year when I have some time. But if he's a 40, I might want to really think about that. (laughs) Yeah. 
you know, and so I shouldn't be drawn this arbitrary black line and say, well, he's a 65 or whatever. I need to look at it. If, he, if he's my dominant bull, I, got, I should think really hard about this. What's he going to cost me? And we also need to look at something else that's really important. That is, is that a cow, after she calves, it takes a certain amount of time for her, her to basically recover from calving, for her uterus to involute, get back down to the normal small size. And basically be able to be bred and carry that calf and become pregnant again. The average cow takes 54 days to do that. Think about this. The average heifer after the first time add 30 days. It ta- Yeah, it takes close to 90 days. Not quite. That's one of the reasons we should breed our heifers about a month early. They need to get ready. So the point of this comes back to the reproductive effectiveness Uh your efficiencies, if I'm in that last, say, that 60 days after I started breeding season, I am not going to be able to take that one and have it just automatically go clear up to the very beginning of my breeding season. Hmm. He can't get ready in time. So it doesn't just cost me one year. It costs me year after year trying to bring him back up. I can start to bring him back up, generally a little bit at a time. But if I have a lot of them strung out, I'm not going to do that real quick. It takes time. You got to call out the latest ones, help to bring the, a few of them up that you can, and you will bring some of them up, but it's not going to be a way that I'm going to bring them up, you know, two months, something like that. Yeah, I can bring, I, I, I figured about 70, 71% of them will come and you can bring them up one cycle, but to bring them up two or more cycles, it just doesn't happen. And they're not all going to move up. Just some of them are. And if you also look at something that happened to us a lot this last year is with the with the weather, this happens all the time. We get these droughts and stuff that happens. We don't have the feed, so we have, and we know how that can affect our cattle. If we have strung our herd out and we have a lot of late calvers, the chances of those, because our feeding becomes more scarce, of then being able to be bred when they're in the late area, that's when you end up with also these crashes of a lot of opens because we allowed our herd to become very reproductively ineffective. Hmm. And you end up losing out on that one. So, so lots of things to think about there. Um, yeah. and a lot of different areas to, to take it. And, and hopefully from this, we can start to think about and look at uh, our own, you know, reproductive effectiveness within our herd and put some more emphasis and some more information into our own herds, knowing where we're at, looking at what we need in our bulls and what we need in our cows, what we need in our nutrition and those types of things to create this really reproductively efficient herd. Some really good stuff there, Glenn. And I really appreciate your time today. I do have a couple of things I want to clean up, uh, that you said, uh, I guess no pun intended when we're talking about bulls, but, um, one of those things was you said that it takes 60 days for the spermatogenesis to take place and then another 10 days for it to get into the epididymis. Uh, so are you t- telling me it takes 70 days for that bull to produce the amount of sperm he's going to use in a breeding season? Um, okay. So, Probably not look at it exactly like that, but almost the, the only the last part in the breeding season. So basically the, the point would be is, is if I do a bull brain sinus exam and I get an ejaculate and look at that semen, or he just bred a cow today, that started 70 days ago, approximately. And the reason that's important is, is because if I look at, and this is really cool, something that we don't think about sometimes even as veterinarians as much as we should. And I, I find it fascinating. If I basically look at it and I say, I'm finding a bunch of detached heads. So that basically, that's a, that's a head without a tail on it. Or I see what's referred to as a piriform uh, form. It's basically a narrow head uh, on that sperm. I can look at that and I can say, I know that this is an abnormality. And I can look at spermatogenesis and I can understand what happens. There's a part of spermatogenesis also called spermiation. Think of it as germination. You plant a seed in the ground and it germinates. So the first part of it, you actually have meiosis, basically the the basically proliferation of the germ cells taking place. That's the first thing that happens. And then after a while, it matures and it spermiates. It it germinates in a will in a way, if you will. So it matures and it comes out. And that's a fair that you know each time has different things that can happen to it. But that's a, a time that just like a seed in the ground, if it gets too dry, it gets stressed you don't have the germination that you might have expected. Spermiation can be the same way. You have a lot of stress at that time. About three weeks ago is when some of these might have happened, when I'm actually checking it, when spermiation happened. Or was it 100% genetic 
And it started happening in that proliferation stage, clear back in the very beginning of spermatogenesis. It's fascinating. And so if I check that bull uh, today and I'm seeing that, I can recheck it in, say, about four weeks when I know the stresses, either heat stress, cold stress, uh, disease, um, something else that happened. And am I still getting that same thing? Am I, if I'm still getting that same problem, it may have been genetic. If I'm not, then we had something occur environmentally to that that made it, and my bowl's good now. So not thinking, hey, this is a one-time deal, I should just check it one time, but understanding what happens within this spermatogenesis. Or is it even a storage problem, storage within the epididymis? And so, so yes, basically it does. It takes that time for that, and there's different things that happen all through that. And within the epididymis, when it's storage, we just say storage, well, it's actually a, a, also a time when the matures uh, when things are happening, that gets that sperm ready to do its job. Heck, even even once it enters the female, certain things happen. A capacitation is what they called that has to occur for that sperm to do its job. Which also leads me to another really fascinating thing. Oftentimes we hear the thing, "Oh, it only takes one." <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> it takes thousands of them uh, for them. And there's little on the outside. There's an acrosome. We also look at those. An acrosome has enzymes in it that basically helps to penetrate the egg, if you will. It takes more than one of those to get through that egg. It has to beat at it, beat at it, beat at it. It takes, so if the, if that acrosome is all messed up and we have enough of those acrosomes, it can't, they can't penetrate that egg. They can't get into it. And that would create it. So you'd have a decreased pregnancy rate. So yeah, it's fascinating. It is just a, a really interesting thing. Um, I've been working on, and I could share it, uh, actually creating a, a chart that shows this. So um, I'll let you know what that, where that can be found uh, in your show notes page. I'll send you a link to it that you can include with it. And I'll, I'll put that chart on a website that people can look at it. So they can say, oh, this is pretty interesting. Uh, I'll even create some pictures that people can look at on what are some of these abnormalities I'm talking about that people can access. And of course, you can also do some Google searches look for those types of things. I haven't seen a lot of great charts that actually so, shows each thing throughout the spermatogenesis, but definitely pictures of different sperm cells and abnormalities can be found. Uh, and so, yes, uh, the more understanding we have of how this works, the more we can then help our herd and help our bulls to get where they're supposed to be and where we want them. Whether you're a bull buyer, a bull producer, those seed stock producers all the way clear up there that the, even, even the guy that you bought the bulls from, where's he getting his genetics from? Hmm. And it needs to start all the way at the top in talking about this, understanding this and bringing that all the way down through. Very good. So I can't let you go without touching on this one line from your article. The only way to improve a genetic pool is to put pressure in the direction you want it to go. So you've talked a lot about sexual maturity is there a phenotype that lends itself to an earlier maturing animal as far as sexual maturity goes? Yeah, a lot of things have already happened really good in that area, meaning that when we started putting more emphasis a few decades ago on basically the size of the scrotum, that helped. That helped a lot. So the other thing is, is I kind of put out that 14 month, and of course, everybody's a, maybe a little different. The reason I put that out there is if you remember uh, we have genetics there that we're trying to do specific things with. And I want to then breed that cow. If I'm waiting until 15 months, then I don't have that extra time for her to get ready to be bred back to the next year. So I'm giving her that extra time. So I'm putting that cut off around 14 months. And at the same time, if I'm testing those bulls at 12 months, have I given them the time they really need to become uh, sexually mature? So it's so to, to me there, and it becomes pretty simple. If you're wanting to push that for that maturity, then we ought to kind of draw that line somewhere. And that 14 month would be a pretty good place to draw it. Uh, so yeah, I think that they should be able to, for the most part, pass that bull breeding centers exam right around that area so that we know that not only is that bull ready to go, but the heifers that he is throwing would also be potentially ready and mature. Uh, last fall, uh, I was AI'ing for a guy and there was a couple heifers that you could tell just they, they weren't cycling yet. They just weren't there. The, the cervix was too small. They hadn't matured enough. And there's nothing I can do with it. And so that's one I'm not going to get a pregnancy out of. We, we wasted our time and effort and money on that heifer because our genetics weren't in place for that. So yes. Yeah. 
So very good stuff. You know, um, when, when my t-shirts are made, I will send you one. It's fertility drives the bus. And, uh, so I've got the artwork done. I just, I just got to get the t-shirts actually made, but you, you got one coming your direction hey, when they come. So, uh, it's the, the cow driving the bus towards profit and, and it's fertility that drives that bus. So anyways, anything we can do to improve fertility is something that we want to, we want to do. Absolutely. Uh, the other, the other thing, you know, that comes to my mind while I'm listening to you talk is maybe more days on green grass before bull turnout is a better thing for everybody involved. Uh, just something to think about. And I'm, I'm not sure if you have an opinion about that. Oh, absolutely. And in fact, sometimes they'll do what they refer to as flushing. So I have had, especially on your heifers, uh, starting with a little bit of grain, you know, look at that nutrition is so important. And even getting a spend a little money and get a nutritionist involved a little bit and say, okay, well, what do I need to do? Some of our grasses, you know, especially if they're a monoculture, they're not going to be nearly as good as if you have a variety in there. Uh, but even at that, don't be afraid to find out what supplements does my herd need. And in my geographical area, it may be supplements for uh, micronutrients. How's your zinc doing? How's the copper doing? Uh, do I have high sulfur that's tying stuff up? Um, and then also, you know, what other types of things do I need to make sure they're ready? And so you're right. We want to have all the cattle in a positive energy uh, area before the bulls are turned out. And you want that to be going for a few weeks beforehand. Uh, that gets them cycling well, and that gets both the bull and the cows doing well before basically breeding season. If they are losing weight, and that's one of the things too, if, if you look at your genetics and you're getting something that produces a lot more milk, What's that potentially doing and what's your resources? If we're producing so much milk that we're drawn from that cow, it's one of the problems dairies could potentially have. And it's one of the things they have to look at and say, what do I need to do nutritionally so that I am not losing weight and I can get them bred back up. And if you're gaining weight, uh, getting that positive energy balance, then they are absolutely going to breed much better. And you have to look at the bull too. You can't just look at the cows. So I've kept you probably past the maximum amount of time I told you I would take from you today, but I really appreciate your time. Is there a way that you would like me to tell people to get a hold of you if they want to talk more about this, if they want to maybe have some some time to talk a little bit about uh, how they could start to implement this on their operation? Yeah, you know, I'd love to share this with anybody who's who's interested. In fact, I was thinking I'd like to get the just the word out more, or if nothing else, the conversation started more. And so I would be willing to, to give my services. If you had like a producer meeting and could maybe at least help me get there and back home again, I'd be more than glad to, to come help talk. Uh, and and I, what I'll do is, is I'll also create a, a website. I'm going to call it Integris Cattle. Uh, you can share that with it uh, and some contact information there. Um, also be willing to share a phone number with you. Uh, that'd be 435 seven four nine one zero five four now of course i'm a veterinarian you may just have to try again give me a text that's probably actually one of the best ones give me a text get back with you later because uh you know my hand might be somewhere it doesn't belong who knows uh, and so you know i can't always necessarily get to it right then but yeah if people have questions want to get with me uh also i can leave my email hey that one can be really easy uh just glenn at emory animalhealth.com pretty easy E-M-E-R-Y, animalhealth.com, uh, and send me a note that way too, another great way to get in contact me. i uh, love to just get this opened up and start talking. I, I really feel like we've looked at it too much like it's black and white. Let's, mm -hmm. not, let's not make reproduction our bulls black and white. It's not yes or no. It's basically what can we do to drive our bulls into better reproduction. And there's, I'm sure there's many ways to do it. I'm talking about one. Uh, and I'm saying, let's not be scared to look and compare bulls a little bit uh, and understand that, yeah, I won't win on every time I compare. But if I look at it enough and I push those genetics in the right direction, yeah, I can improve it. Good stuff, Glenn. Really appreciate your time today. And we will put links to all that in the show notes page at workingcows.net slash 87. And I, I look forward to continuing this conversation. And I think there's a niche market there for somebody who wants to get into this uh, idea of showing actual breeding soundness in a range, not just black and white. So yeah, thank if somebody you. wants to start that business, go for it. <laughs> thank you very much for having me. I think this has been great and hopefully uh, informative to other people. Love to hear people's thoughts and comments, you know, pros, cons, whatever, different ways to think about it. 
uh, you know, and how you feel about it. I think that would be good to open the conversation up. Thanks, Glenn. Thank you. Good stuff there with Glenn. Really appreciate him reaching out to me and uh, asking me to just consider talking to him about these different types. And if you want to reach out to the Working Cows podcast, you can do that at 605-549-5401. Call us, leave us a voicemail. Maybe we'll play it on the show someday or reach out to me at workingcows.net slash contact. Over the next couple of weeks, I got some really fun episodes with uh, Bob Kenford coming back on the show and talking to him about the three quarters misguided motivations of the American Prairie Reserve. So be sure you're subscribed so you don't miss any episodes, and we'll see you next week with another episode of the Working Cows Podcast. We invite you to visit workingcows.net to subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, resources from our guests, and the industry leaders who have influenced them. For more ideas on putting your cows to work for you in a more profitable way, tune in next week.